Welcome to The Dish, the show that uncovers the stories behind the world's most famous dishes. We are your hosts, Tomo and Megzi from foodfuntravel.com. Join us and expert guests for tasty facts, foody secrets and more. In this episode, Greek feta cheese versus Bulgarian Sereni cheese versus Romanian Telmir and all other white brine cheeses, which was the original. Plus, we discuss the ancient history of feta-style cheese from the Balkan region, and should the EU have made feta cheese a Greek-only designated origin product. We explain the origin of the name feta, plus we look at how Canada may have got it right when it comes to feta cheese. All right, welcome to another episode of The Dish. Today we are talking about a dish that is also an ingredient in lots of famous foods. We are talking about feta cheese, probably the most famous brined white cheese in the world. I love feta cheese. And I think it definitely can be a dish in itself because if you've ever been to Greece and you've had feta with honey baked, then Mm. you know that it is is a dish. It is a dish. Deep fried feta in phyllo pastry with honey and sesame seeds. Fantastic. Mm. Also, just feta baked with like peppers, tomatoes, and onions in the oven. Yep. Uh, amazing. Give me some of that. Lots of olive oil. But yes, you can just get feta as pieces of feta on a cheese plate. Put it in a salad. Why not? Yep. Greek salad, lots of other salads. But. The crazy thing that not everyone will know is that feta cheese is in no way a unique cheese. Well, it is a unique cheese because it's the Greek version of brined white cheese. But very similar cheeses have been made around the entire Balkan region, Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East and beyond, probably since at least 8000 BC. What? I didn't know it'd be that old. Yes. Uh, In this episode, we will explore the history of white brined cheese, as well as the controversial decision by the EU in 2002 that feta cheese is only a Greek product and all the other white brined cheeses cannot be called feta cheese. Yes, that's quite controversial. It is a little bit. So we're going to be talking about that. Before we get started, of course, just a reminder, please subscribe if you like The Dish, this podcast. Not just feta cheese, the, the show. Yeah, if you if, <laughs> no, if it's you a, like feta cheese, subscribe. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, subscribe, rate, and review. Um, of course, listen to the episodes first before you start leaving ratings. Get to the end. Don't start leaving ratings in the first thirty seconds because I don't think we've really given you enough yet. It's we've got right. so much more to give. So much more to give. But you know, yeah, do subscribe to the show if you enjoy it. We've got lots and lots of episodes out there already published and ready to listen to. So get it done subscribe to The Dish right now or the second you finish listening to this episode. All right, let's start off with the controversy between all these different white cheeses. This actually first became a big deal for us when we visited Bulgaria because Bulgaria borders Greece and they also have a white brined cheese that is incredibly similar to feta cheese. It's called Sereni cheese and... Well, let's just say that locals in Bulgaria are quite fiercely proud, and many would suggest that Bulgaria has been producing this sort of cheese even longer than Greece has. Yeah, it's quite a contentious subject in Bulgaria, because of course they're very proud of the food that they make. If you've never been to Bulgaria, the food is incredible, and is the wine. It's it's one of those really undiscovered countries for foodies. It's you definitely need to add it to the list. But anyway, yeah, they get fiercely proud about, especially when it comes to things like cheese, uh, also yogurt, which we'll talk about in another episode and a few other things. Dairy products are definitely one of Bulgaria's main things. And to be fair to them, I, I'm on the fence. I think their Serena cheese is as good as feta. It always depends on exactly which producer you get it from. Of course. Of course. So there's some amazing fetas and some amazing Serena cheese as well. But yeah, I think the best white cheese I've had, probably Bulgaria has topped the feta. Is it because it's like a little bit saltier in Bulgaria? I think it is a bit saltier, but once again, it always comes down to the producer. Yeah. And it also comes down to the mix of milk. And we'll talk about that a little bit throughout this episode. Different mixes of milk are going to produce different sorts of cheese. That's true. And when it comes down to feta, I think 
texture is a really big thing. Like, you know, is it going to be creamier or crumblier or, you know, feta can be done in so many different styles. Everybody's going to have their own different opinion on what they prefer. Although the EU has specifically, strictly set down some guidelines on feta cheese. Oh, well, I guess if it's a designated, like a DOP sort of thing. It is. It's a DOP, which in English is a PDO, a protected designation of origin and has been since 2002. We're going to get into the exact details of that later in the episode. But the controversy right now, I feel, is that in popular culture, maybe just as an easy way to communicate an idea... But we've definitely heard the word feta used to describe all different types of white cheese that are similar to feta. So, I mean, Romanian feta, which is actually called Talmea, it's almost exactly the same product, but it's made differently, but it tastes very similar. And Bulgarian feta, as I said, is called Serene cheese. Yeah. These terms are used, the word feta is used in popular language because it makes it easy for us to understand what people are talking about. Exactly. Greece has marketed feta so well that that's just the go-to term that people use for all cheese that is white and crumbly. It's even beyond Greece's marketing of feta as to why the word feta has become popular around the world. So we're going to get into that as we go on as well. But as I said before, yes, the feta cheese from Greece is now only able to be made in Greece. Yeah, it's like champagne in France and other things. You, You can only... Feta made in Greece can be called feta. If someone's calling it that somewhere else, they could be slapped with a cease and desist. They could actually be uh, fined quite a lot of money. Yeah. Outside the EU, it's not quite as strong, but if you're in the EU and certain other countries that have accepted this guideline, then yeah, you've got a lot of problems. If you're putting feta on the label, you better be making it in Greece. So we're going to be talking about that as we go through the episode. There's actually a surprising amount of information for all of this. So it's actually going to be a pretty bulky episode, I think. Um, So most listeners will probably have tried feta already, but let's just talk a little bit about what it is for those who don't know, or even for those who do know, because some of this was news to me. Mm. So yeah, it's a brined curd cheese, and brined obviously being it's made and stored inside of salty water. So it's quite a salty cheese. It's made from sheep's milk or a mixture of sheep and goat's milk. And it is a crumbly aged cheese. So unlike cottage cheese, which is not aged at all, we're talking about something that's aged normally for at least three months. So it's nothing like as crazy aged as some very strong cheddars or Parmigiano Reggiano or anything like that, but it's still aged. It is not a fresh cheese. It's commonly produced in blocks and has a slightly grainy texture with, of course, the very salty hit. Yep. Now, this bill in the EU passed in October 2002, and it limits the word feta within the European Union to only mean a brined cheese that is made exclusively of sheep's or sheep's and goat's milk with a maximum of 30% goat's milk. So they have limited the milk. And that's one of the biggest differences that we'll talk about in other cheeses that are similar to feta. They don't necessarily stick to those proportions, but feta cheese has to. And also it can only be produced not just in Greece, but specifically in the Peloponnese, Central Greece, Epirus, which is in North Greece, Thessaly, also sort of North Central Greece, uh, Macedonia, which is Thessaloniki in that region, yeah. Thrace, uh, which is also North Greece, and the islands of Lesvos and Cephalonia. I don't know those two islands. Personally, we haven't been those, but some of the other areas we have actually been to. So the I think bio- Cephalonia is really pretty. Oh, Cephalonia? Yeah. Oh, if I I think, if it's the place I'm it. thinking of, I think they've got, like, it's got really beautiful beaches and cliffs and stuff like that. So literally just a couple of islands that were specifically given permission to be people who could call it feta. Mm. And all so the it's other not just islands. Greece, it's no, like very no. specific locations in Greece. It is those exact locations that have been designated. And the reason is because of the climate, which it always is with these sorts of food products. Yeah. It's a slightly cooler climate than other parts of Greece. I believe that's the main reason. And they're sort of mountainous. Some of these areas are more mountainous, definitely. Um, Thessaly, Epirus. So you've got your goats and sheep running around on the mountains. Yep. So you're getting a different sort of milk quality because these are actual herded mountain goats and sheep and stuff like that. So it should be noted at time of recording that the USA has not accepted this protected status. And feta cheese that is purchased in the USA may say feta on the packet, but not have been produced in Greece at all. It might have been made in the USA because uh, they have not agreed to observe this. Um, so you need to pay attention to that when you're purchasing. Oh, yeah. If you're in America and it says feta, don't think it comes from Greece. If you're in the EU, it comes from Greece. Yeah. 
if it specifically just says feta cheese on it, it's from Greece. It has to be. There are actually, there's some really big trade deal going on at the moment between the EU and the USA. And one of the reasons it hasn't actually been finalized is because of all of these specific uh, terms with designation. Mm. So it's been held up for years because the USA won't agree because they have so many people producing these products in the USA and using that name as a trade name yeah. that they won't be able to do that anymore. So that's why they've been holding the, the trade agreement back. I mean, it makes sense. It's really tricky, but still, it's like if you want to you deal, you got to play ball. So I don't know. Whether they feel the deal is worth it or not, but apparently it would be worth a lot of money if they make it work. But still, we're not getting into politics because nope. we don't care about that. Oh, couldn't um, care less. Let's talk about Sorene cheese. This is the Bulgarian version of feta. And actually in the US, it is called Bulgarian feta because they have no rules about this. <laughs> so if you see Bulgarian feta in the supermarket, it is it is the Bulgarian style. is isn't necessarily even made in Bulgaria. Might be, might not be, but there's no rules for that. But it will be similar to what you'd get if you had Serene cheese in Bulgaria. Now, Serene can be made from goats, cow, or sheep milk, or any combination of those three. Mm. So there is no specific rule. It is quite a soft, wet, and crumbly cheese. It is, I mean, the, the consistency is quite similar to feta. I would say it's a little softer. Yeah. It's not quite as firm as feta. And uh, the fat content's about 44 to 48%. That's what you want. Mm, yes. Uh, it also has that slightly grainy texture and, of course, a slightly lemony, salty taste. The cheese is served with soups and salads as a table cheese and used in baking, things like benitsa, mm. which is a type of Bulgarian pie. So good in benitsa. It's very similar to Greece because in Greece they put the cheese in pie, they put it on salads, they serve it at the table, they make it into dips. Yep. Literally... And this is something, if you've never really traveled to the Balkans, which is that whole Eastern European Mediterranean, sort of that corner of the Mediterranean, if you haven't been there, you just don't realize that feta, although it's a cheese and cheeses like it, it's also pretty much a condiment. They use it to flavor things. Yeah. They will grate it up into anything. They will mash it up into dips to add extra flavor to the dips. It's Yeah, it's everywhere. It's used in everything. It's amazing. Oh, yeah, it is. It's the same in Italy, like in Emilia Romagna, Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Oh, it's in everything. It's just in every dish. You yeah. don't even realize, but a little bit of that cheese has been mixed up into sauces. It's been mixed up into the soups and you don't even know. Yeah. So as I mentioned in Romania, it's called Telmia. And so it was a big favorite for us when we were living in Romania for a while that we'd always get that because it's a lot cheaper to get the local cheese than to get the imported feta that is specifically designated by the EU, etc. So that sort of thing pushes the price up. It's always a little bit more expensive because they're importing it. But many, many other Balkan and uh, cheeses from around that region to into the Middle East as well are very similar. They've all got different names. And local consumers in each of those countries are probably very well aware of a, a, you know, like a little bit of difference between them. They know that the Bulgarian ones are slightly softer, wetter cheese than the feta, like that sort of thing. They're aware of it. But for us around the rest of the world who aren't from that region, we just go like, well, it's white cheese, it's feta, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. We're... So we get confused about these things. Yeah. But part of the difference is definitely down to those specific breeds of sheep and goats and perhaps cows, depending on what sort of milk they're using, uh, in all those different regions and the microclimates. So these do affect the characteristics of the cheese and the taste and the texture as yeah. well. And what they're feeding all of those animals as well. Yeah. So with the climate and the specific breed of animals that are being used, it all has a slight effect on exactly what the final product's going to taste like. Now, this was a surprising one for me. In Lebanon, which, of course, is also part of that Mediterranean, East Mediterranean, even though it's more in the Middle East. They, of course, have Greek feta cheese, but they also have the Bulgarian Serene cheese. But there, it's called Bulgarian cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so not only do they have Greek cheese, they have Bulgarian cheese. So they genuinely identify these as two different cheeses. Yeah. So they don't call it Bulgarian feta. They actually call it Bulgar. It's, yeah. It's Bulgar cheese. So, yeah, we're just ignorant, silly English people. Well, really, we sorry. Are. Sorry, world. <laughs> what are you going to do? So, in, the, yeah, in that region, they know a lot more about what's going on. It's pretty crazy. It's fair to say that these cheeses do taste distinctly different, though similar for someone who's not very initiated. Yeah, same, same, different. But it's sort of like comparing Grana Padano to Parmigiano Reggiano. Yeah, like the, you've got to be a real expert to see to discover the nuance difference in, in all of it, yeah. With a blind taste, unless it was a very low-quality Grana Padano and a very high-quality Parmigiano Reggiano or whatever, with yeah. a blind taste, you'd be like, 
taste sort of similar. Not sure which one's which. Like you might pick something out, but in a blind taste, I think most of us would probably get it wrong some of the time. Although that is true with a blind taste, I can certainly say that living in Portugal at the moment, we had some salad cheese from the supermarket, which is branded as being like feta, but they're not allowed to use the word feta, but they stock it next to the feta. And it is very <laughs> obviously feta. There's pictures of salads with pieces of cheese on the front of the packet. Completely different flavor. Like yeah. the really low quality stuff, yes, you can tell the difference. And it's sort of depressing. Well, I mean, that's why whenever we're in these countries, don't even buy stuff in packets. Legit, just go to the deli and ask if you can sample yes. some of the, the cheeses because that's the only way to find the good ones. If you're buying it in a packet, it's just processed and whatever. But if you're getting it from the deli, it's probably come from the farm up the street, you know, or in the next town over. So that's the cheese you want to be trying when you're in these places. Yeah, just taste it. I mean, whatever you like, buy it. Yep. That's it. You don't want to be buying a sealed packet when you're in these sorts of supermarkets. You are allowed to taste the cheese. That's how it is. But I have to say that the very, yeah, I think I mentioned earlier, the very best Bulgarian Sereni cheese I've had I think I actually liked better than the best feta I've ever had. Mm. But it's close. They're both very good. Anyway, as I alluded to at the start of the episode, I didn't even allude. I very specifically said 8,000 <laughs> years of history with feta cheese, but not necessarily feta cheese, but definitely, or at least supposedly, white cheeses in that region. Mm. Although food historians don't actually know the exact origin because it's before written records were really a thing, it's believed that cheesemaking definitely existed since at least 8,000 BC and could have started at the very earliest, pretty much at the same time as domestication of livestock, which they do have an estimate would have been around 10,000 BC. Wow. So it's like one of the first, like other than like, oh, we can drink this. Yeah. Next that, that's the next step was cheese. Well, this is how food evolved. It's like, well, we've got a fresh product, but they only make that once a year. They, they milk, they carve and they have milk once a year. Yeah. We've got all this excess milk that we can get. What are we going to do? All right, let's figure out a way to do something with this. And eventually they accidentally figured out that the milk curdles and then the curds can turn into cheese, which keeps for months. And yeah, it's just how it happened. Just Amazing. trial and error. Yeah. But we're talking about a trial and error period that could have lasted 2,000 years. So <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like you have to be pretty persistent. Well, these people are geniuses. And they were like, it took them 2,000 years to figure this out. Yeah, you can imagine if they, it had taken 2,000 years from us to go to the internet's been invented to now you can Google things. Yeah. Like, you're like oh, now we've got our first search engine. It's only taken 2,000 years. <laughs> and now we've got email. Only 4,000 years. Like how upset would everyone have been? Yeah. Wouldn't have known any better. But still, yeah, that's the point. It's pretty crazy. But, you know, you're hungry. You've got all this excess stuff that you can't drink through. You, you don't want to yeah, you waste. You every just, single season. You can't afford wasting. to waste because you will People go hungry. Die. Yeah. Yeah. They run out of food by the end of the year and they're like, I wish I had some food for the winter. Uh, and then they're like, oh, if we'd made cheese in the spring, mm. we could have stored for a few months. And it would have worked out pretty well. Now, okay, so that's the historic opinion yeah. with no written evidence. The oldest reference written to a white brined cheese, or at least something that is believed to be a white brined cheese, was actually from famous Greek writer Homer oh. in the Odyssey from 800 BC. That was the first. Wow. Apparently, that is the first reference to white cheese. Hmm. I don't know if other cheeses have been referenced elsewhere, but in terms of this story, yeah. and I know this is the best they've got because this was actually used in the court case with the EU to prove Greece's side as I will get uh, into. So this is not, it's not like they've tried to find something else. Like, I mean, they have tried to find something else. And this is literally the oldest reference they can find. Yeah. They were desperate to make feta cheese a Greek thing. I'll give it to them. It is quite an old reference. It is an old book. 800 BC, not so much written references before 800 BC. So, well, I'm going to do the quote from the book. And I guess you can sort of make up your own mind how effective you think this quote is. This is from the literature. We entered the cave, but he wasn't there. Only his plump sheep grazed in the meadow. The woven baskets were full of cheese. The folds were full of sheep and goats and all his pots. Tubs and churns where he drew the milk were full of whey. When half of the snow white milk curdled, it collected it, put it into woven baskets and kept the other half in a tub to drink. And the it they're referring to is the cyclops of Polyphemos, or his name is Polyphemos. So the it in that text is saying it. Because it's not a him, it's a cyclops. cyclops so yeah. that's why they're using it rather than him. 
So it collected the milk. Now they're talking about a snow white. I feel that's milk, quite specific. Curdled milk. And they say the word cheese. Yeah. Because by 800 BC, I mean, this is, a, this is a legend story. It's written as a fiction. But by 800 BC, obviously they're thousands of years into making cheeses. So the word cheese already existed in Greek. Where did the word cheese come from? Oh, uh, well, I mean, they came up with their own word for cheese, which is tiri. Well, I mean, that's like, that's like saying, where did they come up with the word elbow? Yeah. <laughs> they just come up with words. They just make up words. So anyway, according to the myth, yes, this cyclops called Polythemos, was, uh, he created feta cheese, and it was a written record. So although it wasn't called feta cheese at the time. No, but I think the description of it, that does lead you to think of feta cheese. Yeah, and he's got it all left out in pots and stuff, which re- it references the fact that they do leave it in barrels to ferment, yep. uh, to age for a few months. It all, yeah, it does all seem to add up quite well. But yeah, he'd been transporting this milk and that he collected from the sheep, apparently from the sheep, the sheep even, <laughs> from the sheep. He'd used bags made from animal stomachs, apparently, which is Hey, uh, we've the seen style. that used, yeah. They still do that in, in, in Mongolia today. They use sheep stomachs. I'm sure there's plenty of other places, but we saw it with our own eyes in Mongolia, yeah. But apparently, well, the belief is that he hadn't realized that it would turn into cheese, but he left it in an animal stomach by accident and then came back and realized it had curdled and went, well, this is still tasting good. I'll keep this. So it's sort of like this, they're describing something that they already know about and they're using it in a novel, in fiction. Yeah, it's quite say, common. Even this yeah. beast, this cyclops had figured out how to make feta cheese, just like we do back home. Because Homer managed to basically describe the entire process in a prose form, but he still described it. Yeah, so it's been around for a while before Homer ever wrote about it. He was well aware of what it was, and he used it in the story. Mm. And if even a Cyclops could make it, yeah. And Homer was Greek, so he was saying, well, yeah, that's that. But anyway, we'll get more onto whether the Greeks have the full claim or not as we go along. So yeah, the ancient Greeks called the product which came from the coagulation of milk, tiri. And they still do today. So like tiri pita is a cheese pie mm. and very nice. I could go one cheese. right now. Thank you. But the, do you think they delivered? From Greece to <laughs> Portugal. Uber Eats. I think you'd need to be one of those very rich people ordering. It was like some news story I saw the other day that like it could have been April Fool's, but it was like <laughs> rich Nigerians are ordering <laughs> pizza using British Airways. Flights or something random. That pizza's not going to be great when it arrives. Yeah, they realise it's not going to be fresh. It's going to have gone soggy dough. Yeah, I don't know. It must have been an April Fool. I don't know. I'll have to look up the actual story. Stop reading just the headlines, Meg. (laughs) Yeah, if you're going to just read the headlines, don't even read anything. Just don't go on Facebook. That's the solution. So the name Feta literally means slice. And it seems to have been used only since the 17th century. This is not a Homer word, that's ah. for sure. And it probably refers to the practice of cutting the cheese into slices, which are then placed in barrels. So, I mean, as we see with feta in a barrel, it's a big block in a barrel. And Massive then, slab. Yeah, you get these little slices, because obviously it was round at one point in a barrel, and then you've got square, well, oblong slices, yeah. which you get when you buy it in the supermarket, the little slices, just like with most cheese, of course. But yeah, they think it comes from the slicing. However... The word feta is not a Greek word. Oh, so here we have the first little controversy. Well, I mean, of course, it's a word that's popular in Greek now, but they only started using it in the 17th century to refer to the cheese. And the original word feta, which is still a word with two T's rather than one T for the word feta, is also the Italian word for slice. Feta. Oh. It means slice in Italian. And etymologists confirm that this word definitely, for the Greek version, derives from Italian and before the Italian, Latin, not Greek. And it was not huh. used in Greece until the 17th century for that cheese. So that's tricky. The word feta and the name feta for the cheese became most popular more from the 19th century. So even in the 17th century, it wasn't like everywhere. But by the 19th century, it was sort of like accepted that that is. This sliced white cheese. Yeah. So fast forward a little bit. In the 20th century, a mass immigration of Greeks to various countries took place, uh, mainly to Australia, of course, big Greek community in Australia. Yeah. Uh, United States, Canada, and also Germany. As a result, lots of Greek communities were formed abroad, and their members maintained a distinct connection to the dietary habits they'd had back home. 
which meant because it's awesome because it's awesome of course greek food is fantastic uh, but it, it meant that new markets were created for feta cheese in all different parts of the world and that is why feta unlike other balkan cheeses became the big cheese product uh, that became part of international trade that everyone knew about yeah makes sense at the same time other cultures from around the region continued to still make their white cheese and have their own local preferences to what they enjoyed just as they had done for thousands of years but most have their own local names. But feta became the generic term, especially in English, uh, that was actually used to describe that type of cheese, the white brine cheese. And into the mid-20th century, by that point, it was pretty much everywhere, white brine cheese. Feta is the word that we use to describe that, regardless of all these other words that are used, like Telmea and Sirene. Yeah. So from Denmark to the UK and the USA, different types of feta were actually being produced and marketed under that name in those countries. So they, it had become a generic cheese that was being made in all these places. It had nothing to do with just being a Greek cheese anymore. So we had, well, I mean, we watched a TV show that was talking to one of the people who run the Yorkshire Feta Company. Yeah. And in the 90s, as well, in the early 2000s, when that all got changed, her whole business got damaged. She kept it going. She had to change the name. Yeah, she had to rebrand everything. Which is pretty crazy. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, that's a big upheaval for a business. And so... You, You've got to think how many businesses around the world had, to, well, in Europe, because they're the ones who have stuck with this legislation. And now elsewhere, legislation. Yeah. So, like, yeah, these companies are having to completely rebrand. But the product that was being made in different countries differed. So, I mean, it had a similarity in that it was a brined white cheese. But in Denmark, for example, which is one of the biggest producers of non-Greek feta, they were mainly just using cow's milk. It wasn't cheap and go at all, because, of course, that part of Northern Europe, it's all cows. Yeah. Like, they don't have the mountains. They don't have all the sheeps and, and the sheeps. I keep saying sheeps. I know. <laughs> That's why I keep saying sheeps. It's That's my right. new plural. Just Get over it. it. Yeah, it's Get fine. over it. I'm, it's I'm fine. down with it. Uh, in the 1990s, when, which was around the time where this whole protected origin thing started and the EU went, let's start protecting some products, Greece were straight in there for petitioning the EU to protect the origin of feta and giving them a geographic designation and banning all these other people from using the name feta. And as we said before, that bill was passed in 2002. So that's sort of some of the story of the cheese, some of the history of the cheese. Let's get on to the debate because I still don't think that it is 100% sorted just because the EU ruled in Greece's favor. There is actually some other contentions to consider. Okay. Tell me, tell me, tell me. So the debate really is with so many different white cheeses from the whole Balkan region that, and across in the Middle East, like it's a huge area and they all make this sort of cheese. Turkey makes one. Yeah. Lebanon has the Bulgarian version. But they're I all think, great. Like, I love the, them all. Like, yeah. And they're all the same sort of thing. And no one knows the specific actual date that anyone started doing it. So it's a little bit controversial. Had feta, I mean, this is the question, had feta become a generic name by 2002? Was it at a point where it had gone beyond a cultural product to be like, well, that's just a, gene a generic name? Consider in England, cheddar cheese. Yeah, I do feel like, I mean, this is obviously my personal opinion, but I feel like feta definitely had gone beyond being a product and had just become a generic name for sure. Because cheddar cheese has never been protected, even though it came from one specific place cheddar. and there's documentation. It it's comes actually from cheddar. called cheddar. Show me the, the town of feta in Greece. <laughs> well, as we know, feta is an Italian word. So. Yep. so yeah, should it be specifically Greek or should it just be a name that everyone can use and you can just uh, designate whether it's Greek feta or Bulgarian feta or, or yeah, Turkish it's, feta? It is interesting that they didn't rule that that would be the, the specifics. It's like, well... You know, just call it Greek feta and then that will be your designated. Like, that's no one else can call it Greek feta because it is obviously coming from Greece. Well, they did discuss it at length and there have been developments before and since. So let's go into some of those. First question I'm going to ask is if we're pinning the origin of this cheese on Greek mythology, which is pretty much the oldest reference they used in the court case, rather than historic record. Should we be also considering what exactly and where exactly? was Greek in 800 BC when Homer wrote this book. Oh, good point. Is this not something to think about? So I took a look at some of the historical maps, and you'll find that Greek settlements, they actually went all the way up to the Black Sea coast, 
uh, through modern day Bulgaria all the way into Romania and beyond. They had settlements on the coast of Georgia on the other side of the Black Sea. We talked about that in the Georgia episode as well. So it's possible to consider that this cheese was being made by locals in any one or all of those regions, and that those regions, they passed the knowledge on to the Greek traders, who then took that knowledge back to Greece, by which time in 800 BC, Homer was writing about it, because by that time it had become common knowledge. Yeah. There's no real evidence suggesting that it was actually invented in Greece. No. Greece, the Greeks were everywhere, and they were getting information and trading with everyone which is good on them. They were an amazing culture. They did a fantastic job of doing that. But they could have discovered that cheese from someone else. Or they could have all invented it pretty much simultaneously or within the same couple of thousand years. Which has happened. Because that happens with historic food. Yeah. But given the belief that in the food science history community, cheese has been around for at least 8,000 years, that was before Greece even existed as a country. It just so happens that Greece seems to have existed in perpetuity for much longer than any of its neighbors. Yeah. So Greece was not a country 8,000 years ago. In 800 BC, Greece was a country, whereas some of these other countries had not yet become the countries they are today, whereas Greece is still the same country. Different borders, but it's still Greece. It's still culturally Greece, which gives them quite a bonus benefit that they can pretty much claim anything from that region because they were all over it at I the know, time. and it's quite difficult as well because like when we, what we discussed in the Georgia episode was that they have the 8,000 years of evidence of winemaking because they have the archaeological evidence. Of course, you know, at least wine leaves a stain, like they found a, a, yeah. a wine stain and that's how they proved it, but uh, cheese is a perishable and so it's, is there any sort of apparatus like cheese making stuff or like that can prove that, they were, that they're the ones who made it in a particular spot? No. No, yeah. no. Not, nothing before 800 BC, that's for sure. And so, obviously, the craziest thing is that, yeah, Greece is just, they've existed as a political entity for so much longer than anywhere else. I mean, just for example, like Turkey, which also make a white cheese. There was no Turkey until like the 16th century. Yeah. It was the Byzantine Empire, which was sort of Greece and, and Rome, you know, as the Eastern version of Rome, the Roman Empire had changed and the Byzantine Empire was Turkey. And then the Turkic tribes came through and they took Istanbul and it's been Turkey for a few hundred years. Yeah. But before that, that was not a thing. So, yeah, Greece, amazing. Greece is amazing and they have done an amazing job at maintaining a cultural presence for thousands of years. Yeah. More so than anyone else in that region. Quite impressive. But still, yeah, does that mean they're sort of cheating with this claim? that They're just like, we've been around longest, so we didn't invent the cheese, but, you know, but still. There's more to consider before we decide that at this point. Something else really important to note is, of course, this oldest reference in literature is to the Cyclops Polyphemus from Homer's story. But the actual island that he lived on was Sicily of Italy mafia fame. Uh... People were coming back in the story. I can't remember which group it was. I think they were coming back from Troy and they stopped in Sicily on the way back. Now, according to historical record, in 800 BC, Sicily was mainly a Phoenician island, which is not Greek. It's a different uh, group. The Greeks started to occupy it around 750 BC. So it seems like, of course, Greeks would have been trading with Sicily yeah. and trading with the Phoenicians, specifically at 800 BC when, or before. But they didn't actually really have a big Greek presence there until 750 BC, which is where they started to, to take over a little bit. So it wasn't Greek at all. So the oldest written reference to white cheese being Greek was from a group of people that went to Sicily, which was not Greek. Interesting. This obviously was not enough to sway the EU council. No, apparently not. But I, th I mean, I wasn't it's in the court case and I've read some of the actual, uh, the written documentation and the, they've actually... There are papers written on this, like oh, scientific papers. Oh, I'm sure the paperwork is just bonkers. I looked through some of it, but, you know, some of that stuff is so boring. <laughs> it's written by the least creative people on the planet sometimes, and it's just tedious. Big, boring words. So I, I had a little bit of a skim through, but I did not find enough of a reason to want to go any further. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But... 
Yeah. If there's anybody out there who has thoroughly read all of these documents, <laughs> get in contact with us. We'd love to hear your opinion. Obviously, Sicily was not Greek enough, but yet uh, the story was a Greek story, and that was no one else could provide any evidence any better than that. that yeah. I'm assuming that's no, what enough. happened. So, if you turn up and you find someone doing something, i.e. a cyclops making white cheese, then can you claim it as your own? Did you invent it? Or did you just find someone doing something who was already doing it in Well, I mean, seeing it's also like a fictional story, too, so it's like... It's all made up. Yeah. <laughs> there was no cyclops. So that, that's the... Uh, yeah, oh, it's very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. But as we said earlier, obviously Homer and the Greek culture in general are well aware of the white cheese situation. I should so- also point out at this point, we love you, Greece. We really do. We love you. Don't please don't get offended. <laughs> we're not we're not dissing you. We're just going through all the facts. We love you. Please let us keep coming back. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but anyway, what I figured from this bit of research is that none of this actually settles any sort of geographical or origin at all. Uh, if anything, it gives more weight to the idea that that style of cheese is so popular and pervasive in the entire region and has been for so long that using a cyclops in a fictional story as Greece's claim doesn't really give you any sort of geographical status that should be protected. It's quite crazy. Yeah, so, and especially now that they, it, can only, it can't be made in only specific places in Greece. Not in Sicily. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you can't even, like, there's some, like, you can't make feta cheese in Corfu. No. But there's no... Or maybe you can. I'm not sure if Corfu is part of Epirus. Because it's it's north. So okay, well, we, we, we're not going to substantiate let's if that's say true or not. Santorini. But yeah, there are islands you can't make it in. Yeah, and is it just because at the time when they were doing the court case, they were like, well, actually, I think the best feta really comes from this region, so let's just make it that. But it seems weird that there's no, as I said, there's no evidence of it ever being particularly made in one particular place, except their own documentation that they used for Homer, which was Sicily. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Love you, Grace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't find the geographical origin to be a great court case. So as far as, ge- as, far as geography goes, I'm totally throwing that out. I'd be like, no, nah, that's not enough. You need something better than that. So now the opposition argued, as we mentioned before, the word feta is actually an Italian word mm. and was an Italian word way before Greece chose that as their word to describe the cheese. But of course, any sort of etymological argument like that is really, really flimsy in my opinion. Because considering English as a language is pretty much made up from Latin and Germanic languages and maybe some Norse words thrown in, we are a mongrel language. And if everything we've used in our language could then be attributed to someone else and be like, oh, they own that, they own that, they own that, uh, the entire English language would be pointless and nothing that we've ever created in the last thousand years or 2000 years would exist. Yeah. Because it would be like, well, that belongs to Latin, so that's not an English product. It's like, yeah, but we invented it. Yeah. (laughs) We just happen to use a word that's similar to a word. Yeah. The etymological argument doesn't make any sense, really. I mean, I get what they were saying is that like, well, we were already using that word, and then the Greeks took that word, and they used it for the cheese, which means because they're talking about the words as being it's a generic term for a type of cheese, they're saying, well, this word feta is a generic term. It's not a Greek word. It shouldn't be a word that they have protected because we've been using this word. But I'm not necessarily aware that Italy was using the word feta to describe a sort of cheese. It, it wasn't a product. Slice. It was a It was action. a word. It was a word. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's why it got thrown out in court. They were like, nah, that's not a good enough reason. So, finally, we come to what is probably the most important consideration, which sort of blows the rest out of the water a little bit at least in my opinion, and that's the cultural identity and the association of feta cheese with a cultural identity. So almost all Western European and international producers who were making feta cheese and have been making feta cheese since the 50s or whatever, they all use Greek iconography, colours, pictures of Greek salad with olives. I mean, olives, that's not a Danish product, yet the Danish were making this feta cheese and using pictures of olives with feta cheese and blue and and white white pictures of these amazing buildings. Yep. They were using the Greek iconography to say, you know what this food is. Just looking at the packaging, you know what this food is. So it's like even the word doesn't matter. They've already said, like, this is a Greek product. They've literally broken their own argument by admitting everything they're making is a Greek product that yeah. they're replicating. And I think even as a consumer, you are more drawn to those ones that look more authentic because you think, oh, this is the real Greek cheese. 
Yeah. So yeah, it is it is instilled in us that we're like, oh, those that packaging, those colors, that sort of stuff. Yep, that's going to be the good stuff because I know that that's authentic. Yep. So when you walk into a supermarket and you see a packet with the word feta and little blue and white buildings and pictures of Greek salad on it, you are well aware of what the product's going to be. If you walk in and see Bulgarian serene cheese with a picture of grated cheese on top of a Shopska salad, which is how they often do it, you're not going to be quite as aware of what product you're buying if you don't know what it is already. I'm going to have to start paying attention to this, actually, because is feta cheese ever sold on top of anything but a salad? Like, is it always like, I know, I know I've seen it on like the packets. I don't know. But yeah, obviously in Greece, it is sold in many formats. No, no, no. I'm what, yeah, packaging. On the packet. yeah. packaging. I'm going to start paying attention to the packages more. It's always a salad. It's always a salad. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's always a salad. That mm. is the, and that is the cultural reference that we all get straight away. So you can walk through a supermarket, even if you're not paying attention out of the corner of your eye, you'll see it and you go, I know what that is. Yep. And that's why the marketing's so powerful. And that's why they wanted to protect it and make it their own thing. It, I mean, obviously, culturally, it is seemingly more their sort of thing, the feta cheese, as opposed to the other names for feta. Anyway, so though some may use the phrase Bulgarian feta for convenience, that's something that's used in the US so that people know the cultural connection. They know what the cheese is going to taste like, even though they don't necessarily eat Bulgarian cheese. They just go, well, it's going to be like feta, but it's the Bulgarian version. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to make people know what your product is. You are you're piggybacking off someone else's hard work, pretty much. I can't believe it's not feta. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it is, but it's not. Although they use that in some cultures to help foreigners understand what the cheese is going to taste like, it's been called Serene in Bulgaria for a very long time, and they're super proud of their heritage. They do not seem to claim at all that their cheese is anything but Serene. You know, they call it Bulgarian feta to help foreigners understand what it is. Yeah. But when you really ask them about it, they're like, no, it's our cheese and it's better than feta. Yep. Better than feta. <laughs> it's got a ring tongue. to it. <laughs> we know what Bulgaria's marketing is. <laughs> better gonna, than feta. Better than but feta. But they can't use the word feta in the marketing. Uh, so they can't say better than feta. They say better than that other feta white substitute cheese. white cheese, Greek style. <laughs> better than that other Greek style cheese that you all know. It doesn't roll as well. Oh, what a shame. Exactly. Now, Bulgaria didn't exist as a country because the Bulgars eventually took over and made Bulgaria that area of land. They turned it into Bulgaria. That wasn't until the 7th century AD, so Greece was way ahead of them on having a homeland. Yeah. But the people who'd been living there before would have been making white cheese. The Thracians, who were living in that area before even the Greeks and before Homer, like 1000 to 1500 BC, was the time where Thrace was becoming very popular. Uh, They would have been likely making that white cheese as well in that region, and the Bulgarians just took over that tradition. But for the name, I think the biggest controversy was actually stirred up by a specific Western European country. It's not the Bulgarians who were putting in all the complaints because they're so proud of their own product that although it's useful to use the word feta, they were not desperately clinging to it. Yeah. Whereas the Danish dairy corporation, who was massive, called Arla, they feared losing a lot of money because their Danish feta would no longer be able to use the word feta. So they were actually the major plaintiff fighting against Greece to keep Feta as a generic name. It came down to money and marketing. Yeah. Sadly, it really didn't have that much to do with the actual product. It was all about, we're going to lose a lot of money if we let you guys take Feta away from us and only Greeks can make Feta because they are like one of the biggest producers in Europe. They eventually had to change the name. I, can't, I didn't actually write down what the name was. It was something completely different, like Espina or something. But yeah, so everyone in, in Denmark eventually figured out that this product had changed its name. Yeah. And it, it was all good, but obviously they lost a lot of money for yeah, quite a while. Yeah, that's, that's a big, big loss. So yeah, let's conclude this from looking at some of the, the facts and some of the information, some of the history. I think a lot of this was all about marketing. I think Greece would probably have won the court case even quicker if they'd just not had these, this opposition from corporations who were going to lose a bunch of money. Yeah. That said, Greece's feta exports rose by 85% between 2007 and 2014. So within a and few let's, years... Let's say, let's be completely honest here, Greece could use some money. Yeah. <laughs> they they kind of need a little bit of help money-wise. Oh, I, I'm not giving them a hard time for that at no. all. 
But let's face it, winning that case really did make it's a big really difference for them. really great for, for the country, yeah. Because now consumers are more aware of the fact that feta, they knew it was from Greece, but they didn't realize that most of the stuff they were buying was made in Denmark or made in America. And obviously in the USA, they haven't changed the naming and they're still allowed to use feta for now. So you're not necessarily buying feta cheese from Greece. So once it was a point where it said salad cheese rather than feta cheese, yeah, Greece started exporting a lot more cheese. Yep. And it's good stuff. I mean, I can't guarantee that the Greek feta is always better than alternatives, but it normally has been. Yeah. I mean, naturally, of course, the place you're going to get the best Greek feta cheese is in Greece. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get it on a, you know, at your corner store. But Bulgarian Serene and all these other ones are also Wonderful fantastic, cheeses. but they taste slightly different. So, as we said, as we've said at length, they are different but similar. Yeah. So, Greece has the oldest written evidence of the knowledge of this cheese being made, though it's widely agreed that the exact origin of the cheese being made is very much lost to history and there is no written record at all. Just assumptions made by scientists based on various archaeology and uh, other written records. Uh, Greece also named and popularized feta to a point where culturally, even if the origin of the word was Italian, whenever we talk about feta cheese, the association is instantly with Greece. Yeah, you've got to give it to them. Like, aside from the Italians who know that word is Italian, I don't think anyone else is sitting around going, hmm, that's an Italian thing, isn't it? Oh, no, it's a Greek cheese. When someone says feta, you don't go, oh, what are you slicing? <laughs> yeah, unless you're Italian, that's not really your first thought, is yeah. it? And even if you're Italian, if you say feta cheese, they're not going, sliced which cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think they've won the cultural war and that's why they, they deserve to win the court case on that basis. Although it has made it more difficult for other people to market their cheese. I feel like terms like Bulgarian feta could help foreigners to identify what the product's going to be like. And it would be really useful if they hadn't gone so hardcore to say, like, you just can't use the word feta. They could have just said, you can't say it is Greek feta. Yeah. You say it's Bulgarian feta and you have to dis- you have to disclose what sort of feta it is. So like it would have to disclose USA feta. Yeah. It needs to say the word Greek on it and I think that would be fair. I agree. That would be more fair than just completely ruling it out because it has damaged the opportunity for other markets who have a similar cheese to help their market be understood. And I think Bulgarian feta is fantastic. Yeah. And they, have a, they should have an opportunity, without people thinking it's the same product, to just know it's a Bulgarian version. It's and different. And let's be honest, if, if they're trying to market it to people that speak English, it is difficult because, you know, a lot of the words that, that they do have for their cheeses are unknown to us. They're not words yeah. that we know or recognize. So people automatically are going to just, you know, if you're there as a tourist or whatnot, you, you tend to just go with what you know. I mean, you and I are a lot more adventurous and we'll just give anything a try. But a lot of people just like to stick with what they know. And they, if they see feta, they're like, oh, I get that. Yeah. But if they see some other word, you don't even know that it's cheese. Unless yeah. it's like explained in English that it's a Bulgarian cheese, but you don't know yeah, anything about it. And I think if you're in Bulgaria and you ask the waiter what this cheese is like, they'll say it's a bit like feta. Because they can say whatever oh, they, they want. They just it. can't print it. So, you know, yeah. you'll find out. But. The job for Serene cheese, which, as I said, I love Serene cheese, Bulgarian cheese. Their job now is to try and get their name, Serene, out there in the way that Feta has gone out there. And it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a lot harder than if they could use the term Bulgarian Feta. But I really hope they can get the name out there. So if you see Bulgarian Feta or if you see Serene, spelled S-I-R-E-N-E, might be pronouncing it a little bit wrong, not sure, then you do. Try it out. Try it out. So, although the word feta cannot be used for non-Greek cheese in the EU, uh, we mentioned it can be used in the US, but some other countries have actually agreed to the EU rules that you might not expect, such as in 2013, Canada reached an agreement. But what they did, which I think is probably the most sensible way of doing it, was they told the EU, sure, we will stop it being called feta unless it really is feta, but you are allowed to call it feta style or feta type cheese but you're not allowed to put a picture of a Greek salad or Santorini on the background. I think that's totally fair. So they're just like, the word is still there so people know what it is, but they're not allowed to use Greek iconography to sell the product. Totally fair. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Because then people are just like, oh, it's that sort of thing. I'll give it a go. Yeah. And then maybe they'll like it. Why not? Just put a sheep on there. And I think this, this sort of logic has been used for other protected products, like, like balsamic vinegar. 
unlike Parmigiano Reggiano that we mentioned earlier, which if it's not that exact cheese made in that exact area from that exact process, you can't use the name Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. But balsamic vinegar, you can have uh, like balsamic vinegar IGP or DOP, which states whether it was made there in the area or whether it was made from products that were grown in the area or whether it's a generic version of balsamic that's got nothing to do with being made in Italy at all. And and that's fine because people know what the product is and they know they can learn and people should be learning that if it's labeled as being DOP, PDO, IGP, etc., that gives it more authenticity. Where if it doesn't have those labels, it's a generic product. Yeah. It's just an education thing. Yeah, and I totally think, you know, DOP products are really important and I love that Europe is doing it and really highlighting the authentic foods of different countries and regions. I think it's fantastic and I'm not dissing that at all. But I think, yeah, with something that has become as iconic as feta and to just suddenly change it in 2002, I do think that there needs to be a little bit of fairness, like we said with what Canada did, a feta style or something like that, because it's, yeah, it, it's just getting confusing for the consumers and it's getting difficult for the people who have been running these businesses for God knows how many years, because feta has been around for God knows how many years. Yeah, well, feta cheese has been made outside of Greece since at least the 1950s. Yeah. And probably quite a lot longer than that. The actual feta cheese with Greek communities who moved abroad. And you think Greek communities who moved to Australia made feta cheese, tried to sell it, and then were told, well, you can't sell it because it's not made in Greece. You've got to change the name. And that's tough. And they're Greek. Yeah. So you've got a 50, you've got a 50 year old company that you've been selling the one thing and you need to rebrand to all of your customers to be like, it's the same thing, but it's, but we can't use the word any. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. So I think it would be more sensible that they just give it an extra level of clarification on a label. And people get used to this stuff really quick. Yeah. They would know like, oh, well, if I want that, consumers who care would know, well, I, I want to check that out. Whereas as soon as you call it salad cheese, everyone's like, ooh, it that doesn't sounds sound like an inferior good. product, right? I've seen salad cheese at Little, and I'm like, oh, that just sounds like the cheap crap. Yeah, and it is. But that's fine. You choose whether you want the good quality product or the low quality exactly, product. Exactly, yeah. So feta style cheese or Greek feta cheese. I will choose. Well, this one's double the price. Well, maybe this week I'll get this because it's better. Yeah, it's always better if you get the original thing. So for me, really, the final question has nothing to do with who has the cultural higher ground on this. Although I think Greece definitely has the cultural higher ground, even if the historical thing is a bit sloppy. Yeah. The real question is, which do you prefer? Have you tried Greek feta? Have you tried Bulgarian serene cheese or any sort of fake Fetters or Romanian Talmea, have you tried any of these cheeses? Mm. Well, you probably tried feta. Have you tried any of the other ones? Which one do you like the most? The name shouldn't really matter, but marketing, unfortunately, rules the planet still in our capitalist society. Getting too political now. But <laughs> it, it does. It should be down to the product, not yep. down to the politics. So which one do you like? Tweet us at Food Fun Travel. What is your favorite type of white cheese? Maybe it is feta because feta is fantastic as well. All right, that's it. Show notes for this episode can be found at foodfuntravel.com slash feta podcast, which will round up some of the things we've talked about. And of course, you should follow and subscribe. Yes, yes. Jump on there and uh, whatever app you're listening to us on right now, if you haven't subscribed already, hit that little subscribe button up the top there and make sure you get access to all of our new episodes when they come out. And if you wouldn't mind, please jump in and also leave us a five-star review. And that way we know that you guys love the show as much as we know you do. And it also helps other people find the show as well. And that means we can make more episodes and uh, find out more history of different cheese. Yes, I like cheese. Yes. Five stars is the best amount of stars. Less than five stars is sad stars. Yeah. Don't make us sad. Mm. We just want to make people hungry and happy. <laughs> Let's go five stars. Whoever is hungry and happy. <laughs> That's why the term hungry angry. and then happy. Okay. That's what I should have said. Yeah. <laughs> we want to make people hungry and then happy. And then happy. So go eat some cheese, people, and we'll see you in the next episode of The Dish. Thanks for listening to The Dish. Don't forget to subscribe and keep this podcast on the air by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Also, come join our foodie community on Facebook in the Food Worth Travelling For Facebook group. Catch you next time.